All right, Sweeple. We are ready to officially start We 21. We're going to open this morning's keynote. If you can please look here up on the stage and give a huge round of applause for SWE welcomes your FY22 president, Rachel Morford. Thank you everyone and welcome both here, for those of you here in Indianapolis and those joining us virtually around the globe. Let's give it up for DJ Megan, that's really awesome. To say that I am excited to start this year's conference is a true understatement. The year leading up to this conference has been full of hope, frustration, great expectations, and constantly pivoting our plans in order to host a WE conference that is safe, meaningful, and beneficial for everyone involved. I hope at the end of these next three days, you feel we will have hit the mark. For those of you attending the program live and in person, welcome to Indianapolis, the crossroads of America. While I know you'll attend as many sessions and networking events as possible, please also take time to enjoy the city, including the Canal Walk, Monument Circle, and the many of the, excuse me, many of the delicious restaurants nearby. And while I want you to both enjoy your in-conference and out-of-conference activities, please do so both smartly and safely. For those of you attending virtually, I want to also extend a warm welcome. With each iteration of SWE's virtual programs, we've learned, and I hope you feel we've enhanced your virtual experience. Please know that you are not alone. Your connection to SWE, whether in person or online, is very strong. And together, we are a collective group that is here to help each other. As a virtual participant, Please engage in chat sessions, networking, and the career fair if you're looking to make a vocational change. But most importantly, reach out and make connections. You never know how a brief encounter can positively alter your course in the future. As your FY22 president, my hope is for everyone attending WE21 to truly aspire to inspire. We all know these words are this year's conference theme, and I want to briefly share why Aspire to Inspire truly resonates so strongly with me. While in high school, I took part in an overnight program to visit a prospective university, the University of Southern California. <laughs> right on. As a part of the program, I met a female engineering student who, just by being who she was, became a huge inspiration for me. She was accomplished as a student, doing the things that I wanted to do, and incidentally, she was an officer in her SWE section at USC. As I progressed in my college career, I met professionals who had what I thought were cool jobs, and they held really cool positions in SWE. In short, they were being who they were, authentic to themselves, and contributing to their community, and that was inspirational. Their words and their actions helped me push through obstacles and create goals that made me strive for more than I ever thought it was possible. Every day, we fuel connections that help people find inspiration. We help them inspire, sorry, we help them aspire for more for themselves. In simplest terms, we are all each other's role models. And that's why Aspire to Inspire is so important to me. My hope is that you find reasons or role models who you aspire to be like. And I hope your connections through casual conversations, networking, or by sharing knowledge in a session will help you inspire others to new heights. As I said a few moments ago, we continue to iterate the WE conferences and this year is no different. In last year's all virtual program, we introduced the virtual awards hall. That hall was met with such success 
we have created a new virtual awards hall for all of this year's awards recipients. One change we made is rather than present award recipients at each of these keynote sessions, we've recorded all of the awards presentations as well as have individual announcement pages. So please take some time to view the virtual awards hall. To do so, you can log into VFairs, the virtual conference platform, and click on the awards hall located in the navigation bar. When you're there, please send notes of congratulations to as many of your friends and colleagues as possible. Reach out and make those connections, again, to everyone. Thank you. And now a word about this year's keynote presentations. This is the first of three keynote presentations for WE21. For those of you attending each live keynote, they will be held here in Hall H in the Indianapolis Convention Center. For those of you attending virtually, please review your schedule and make reminders to attend all three keynotes. As in prior years, each keynote presentation will be followed by an informal question and answer segment. This year, we will be collecting questions via the mobile app. So hopefully you have that all downloaded already. If you don't have it yet, please go either to the Google Store or the Apple Store and download it right now. To submit a question, navigate to this morning's keynote on the app. On the bottom of the screen, touch Submit Your Questions, enter your question on the next screen that comes up, and touch Submit. Although we can't often get to everyone's questions due to time constraints, please submit them, as I may use your question in today's if, you're, if today's keynote agrees to it. We will try to get to everyone's questions, and if we don't, I apologize, but it will be because we've run out of time. Before we welcome this morning's keynote, it's important to thank the sponsors of this morning's session. We have four sponsors today, and each will provide a brief message prior to our keynote presentation. With that, I'd like you to all please welcome our first sponsor, 3M. Good day. I am so excited to address you today. I am so passionate about engineering, about lifting each other up as women, and about 3M. And I am proud that 3M is a corporate sponsor of the Society of Women Engineers. Although I have to say that it is a bit of a disappointment to be doing this via video and not having the opportunity to meet you live. And most importantly, to give out what we'd normally hand out, the 3M post-its, 3M tape, 3M sponges, et cetera, the, the good 3M swag next year. I joined 3M after working for a few years in mining, and I've been with 3M for 20 years now. I'm thankful, really thankful to work for 3M. 3M values diversity and inclusion, not just diversity of gender, background, ancestry, age, et cetera, but diversity of thought and diversity of approach to problem solving. Working with so many smart, fun people makes work every day a new challenge and a new opportunity. I was inspired to be an engineer because of my parents and the constant outsmarting challenge in our house, finding a way to rejig the TV system to be able to watch when they had unhooked with tricks to confound us. And then a roommate in college a year ahead of me studying engineering who became my best friend. 3M has been a wonderful company to work for because of the many different career paths available. You know, the CEO of our company started as an engineer. I've had the opportunity to work as an engineer, work in EHS, supply chain, Six Sigma, etc. I was a plant manager, I led manufacturing and supply chain for a business, and I led operations, dozens of plants across countries. And of course, my current role leading global engineering. Engineers are found in literally every part of 3M. You have the opportunity to follow your path of interest, whether it's in the lab, on the manufacturing floor, in business, out with customers, you name it, it's up to you. And 3M has supported me through life successes and challenges. My husband and I have two happy and healthy kids, our feisty athletic 10-year-old daughter and our gentle academic 12-year-old son and I'm able to be a mom when I need to be and still work hard and contribute at a great career. We lost twins 
two days after they were born. They were born early at seven months, about 15 years ago. And I was able to take all the time I thought I needed to recover after. It was painful and it was hard, and it has made me a more empathetic person, wife, mother, and leader. I remember calling the plant manager at the time and saying, I know my leave is for a couple more months, but I'm ready to come back now. And he said, are you sure you're ready? You should take all the time you need. I said I was, and he said, sounds good, see you Monday. And I was welcomed back by the teams with care and support. Whether you decide to work for 3M or not, I wish you all the best in your endeavors. And please look me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer questions or to connect at any point in the future. Best of luck. Thank you. And now a word from our second sponsor, Intel. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to join you. I am thrilled to be here. Many years ago, in my first one-on-one -on -one with an employee in my group, he had a few questions for me. He asked, how come you are my manager when I have worked for Intel longer than you? How come you are my manager when I know this block design better than you? All those were true. I merely listened quietly. Then he continued to ask, how come you are my manager and you are a woman? Choosing not to answer, I remained quiet for a second. Immediately after, I changed the discussion to pure technical, asking him about his next step in the design. Inside, I was sure that I'll do my best and I'm going to be excellent manager, such that he will naturally understand how come. There I started my journey to take on problems and issues as challenges to excel, and here I am today. Obviously, the incident occurs many years ago, and today the situation like this would be rare. The dramatic change has been propelled by organizations like SWE and the many companies that support them. Intel has been a long time support for SWE. We have been a member of the Corporate Partnership Council for over 15 years and are proud of our many Intel employees who have held leadership roles at different levels of the society. Organizations like SWE have helped elevate the role of women in technology, supporting our goal of increasing women in senior leadership roles at Intel and across the industry. You may be aware that Intel rides on the bold purpose of creating world-changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on Earth. And as we all continue to navigate COVID-19 and other challenges throughout the world, our purpose has never been more important. The technology we are creating, from cloud to edge to client, is more essential than it has ever been. And together with our partners, we are providing the vital services, tools, and infrastructures to millions of people. Without you and the generation who follow you, this would not be possible. Your role as technologists, engineers, and leaders is critical. We have our commitment as an industry leader to continue to empower and support you. On a personal note, I can tell you that senior women leader and diverse population always brings a new angle, a different view, an additional solution that makes results better and on higher quality. Being open to listen and see different points drives forward progress and enables great innovation and solution that we see. We don't have to be like them to make an impact. We just need to learn how to work with others to impact and inspire them. Intel is proud to be a positive example of diversity and inclusion in the high-tech industry and to partner with organizations such as SWE. I invite you to take full advantage of the learnings and opportunities this year annual conference has to offer. Remember always, aspire to inspire. And in the words of Intel co-founder Robert Noyes, go off and do something wonderful. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you to Intel. And now, please welcome our third sponsor, NSF. NSF. 
funding basic research that often leads to discoveries and technologies almost unimaginable. And while we're best known for supporting university-based basic research, we also go on to help move new ideas from the lab to the marketplace. Here's how. We're a small company, and our original technology was based out of a university. We needed funds to see how well this could really work. Every year, NSF helps launch innovations that promote the social good, funding about 400 high-tech startups and small businesses for early-stage product development while taking no equity. NSF develops and leverages public-private partnerships between academe and industry to accelerate the transition from lab to market. We've created 80 cooperative research centers that bring companies, universities, and government agencies together to tackle major research challenges like food security, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, and computer science. And we teach NSF-funded researchers to think like entrepreneurs and gain insights into viable ways to move their discoveries out into the world. The i program focuses on lab-to-market activities it teaches researchers a unique set of skills that helps them to turn their research discoveries into real-world products and services. NSF, fostering opportunities to discover, create, innovate, and grow. From imagination to innovation to commercialization. Thank you to NSF. It's great to have you help bridge the gap from idea to commercialized concept. And now, please welcome our fourth and final sponsor, Rolls-Royce. Thank you, thank you, good morning. How cool is this? I get to be here in person, yeah. We, Rolls-Royce, are extremely proud to be one of this year's sponsors. Our company is known for pioneering the power that matters, for providing the power that protects our freedoms. We have very ambitious business goals and are on a mission to lead the change in the transition to net zero technologies. At the core of all that we are and all that we aspire to be are our people. We recognize the power of diversity, the power of inclusion, and as a female executive in this industry with an industrial and systems engineering degree, I personally understand the, yeah. <laughs> I personally understand the importance of inspiring a young lady, a young woman, a little girl to be all that she can be because you've told her that she can and you've given her the opportunity to do so. And this is why organizations like SWE are so very important. We must do all that we can to inspire women as well as the next generation of female engineers and leaders. And so I'll leave you with a really cool video. Can't come here without showing our products, have to do that. Uh, and I also wanna put a shameless plug for those of you that are available, we will have a V-22 flying over downtown around noon. Uh, yes, Rolls Royce products. So I wanna show this really cool video for you that hopefully not only gets you excited about Rolls Royce as pioneers of power, uh, but also gets you excited about the company the company that will need even more women and even more diversity to help us maintain the standard of excellence that is our brand. Please enjoy this really cool video and thank you.
Thank you, Rolls-Royce. It's really wonderful to see an Indianapolis-based company supporting today's keynote. As I said earlier, I, we really appreciate all of our sponsor participation. Your participation makes sweet programs possible. So again, thank you all. <laughs> this morning's keynote speaker calls herself an accidental engineer. Having joined Lockheed Martin in 1987, her series of roles has led her to her current position as Executive Vice President, Rotary and Mission Systems. In this role, she oversees over 34,000 people, over 1,000 different programs, and $16 billion in company revenue. Wow. In addition to her role at Lockheed Martin, she is a constant advocate for STEM education and is a big supporter of SWE's mission. During our earlier podcast interview, I found her to be an exemplary leader, an inspiration, and a kindred spirit. I am certain her presentation will provide us with valuable, actionable insights to benefit us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephanie C. Hill. everyone and thank you so much Rachel for that warm introduction and thanks to all of you for being here and on screen today. Throughout my career and really my life I've thought a lot about purpose and authenticity. Purpose because I believe that we all have talents and special gifts that allow us to make a unique difference. Authenticity because in my career especially, my style was very different than many of the leaders I met early in my career. So I sometimes worried about what that meant for my future. I have learned over time that these two ideas are fairly well linked and that being authentic can help ensure that you live your purpose. So let me begin. As we are all continuing to navigate this global pandemic, and the changes it has brought to our day-to-day -day lives, many people are struggling with their purpose. With the demands of the office and the family, children and or elder care, this moment in our history has really challenged us. It has particularly challenged women. Since the start of the pandemic, more than 54 million women around the world have left the workforce. And a recent McKinsey study found that women are even more burned out now than they were a year ago. And that the gap in burnout between men and women has almost doubled. The pandemic has elevated the importance of organizations like the Society of Women Engineers, the world's largest advocate and catalyst for change for women in engineering and technology. Your mission is one I truly appreciate and one that I champion and advocate for every day. It's a personal and professional passion for me. The world just needs more women engineers like you, like us. More women, right? Come on, more women, all right. <laughs> more women leaders, more women, period. We have an important role to play in the evolution and transformation of both business and society. As an engineer, I believe that this career allows you to make a difference in a huge way. And I want as many young people as possible to pursue a career in STEM, especially for our women and underrepresented people of color where the numbers are just too low. When I decided to become a software engineer right out of college, my sister was bewildered. My sister loves me as well as my mom and dad. She asked me, how could becoming a software engineer ever fulfill me? You're a people person, she said. And you know, I didn't have an answer for her then, but I do now. I have learned over my 34-year career that a job itself is not fulfillment. To me, fulfillment is the opportunity to make a difference to make a difference in my work so that I can inspire and motivate others to do their very best and achieve their full potential. In my church, in my community, 
through service and giving back, and especially in my home, to show love for my family in any and every way that they need me to. Most of us don't just have one purpose. We are multifaceted. Life circumstances and situations will often highlight for us opportunities to discover new ways to make a difference with whatever our talents and special gifts are. So when I talk to people who ask if I'm living my purpose, I normally offer a slight adjustment. And I say it's not always about living your purpose. I believe that you should infuse purpose into your life every day. I'm blessed, I'm blessed to have witnessed this and learned about this from my family since the day I was born. My mother was a kindergarten teacher until I came along, and she came home then to take care of me and my two older sisters and dubbed herself a domestic engineer. Throughout my childhood, she was not a housewife for Doris Cole, she was a domestic engineer. And I remember so many times being out with mommy in the mall or on the street and seeing all these adult men and women and they would look at mommy and she would look at them and then she would proclaim, oh, Stephanie, there's little Johnny Robinson. And I'm like, where? And then little Johnny, this 50-ish guy, six foot three, 250 pound man comes over and says, Mrs. Cole, it's so good to see you. You haven't changed a bit. And I thought, I know what an incredible nurturer and caregiver and person my mother is to me and my sisters, our family, and our friends. But little Johnny from nearly 50 years ago still remembers her with love and fondness. She must have been an amazing teacher. She was. She is all of those things. Whether a teacher or a domestic engineer, my mother is simply an amazing person who chooses to make a difference in every life she touches with love, grace, concern, intellect, and diplomacy. She infuses purpose into each day, and she's still doing it today at 92 years old. Both of my grandmothers were domestic workers. My paternal grandmother was a cook and my maternal grandmother was a maid. Both of them lived long, meaningful lives. My maternal grandmother, get this, worked full time until she was 93 years old. <laughs> she lived in her right mind until she was 101, and she danced at her 100th birthday party with my uncle. Neither of them, I hope I have some of what she had, neither of them had much education, but my grandmother's taught our families incredible lessons. They taught us to dream big because you can achieve anything if you're willing to work hard, keep a good attitude, treat people well, and truly look for the possibilities beyond any obstacle. Between the two of my grandmothers, they produced one judge, one lawyer, one PhD, one teacher, and three other children who made an impact on people's lives every day of their lives. I share these stories because I'm positive you can relate. You have these stories too. From my family history, just that history alone, I learned that our purpose may not be one fixed, immutable thing. Sometimes purpose is temporal meaning that at different times we serve different purposes based on what the situation, circumstance, or opportunity demands. Some of you may know, as Rachel shared, that I call myself an accidental engineer. I never expected to get into engineering. I was good at math, but I, it wasn't until I took a computer science elective in college, COBOL programming, where are the COBOL programmers? I know you're here, okay? <laughs> Some of you can relate that I absolutely fell in love with it and decided to reimagine my future. That one class set me down a different path from the one I assumed that I would take. That choice has blessed me with a wonderful career and I'm grateful. I've had the opportunity to work on some truly impactful systems that help our nation and our allies, and in particular, our military, to execute their mission for national security. And these experiences that some might think would just check that purpose box right there for me. But there were many times I questioned whether my path was the best one or the right one. 
Then I think, had I not stumbled into engineering, so much about my life and career would be different. Most important, I wouldn't understand the need to work as hard as possible to get more of our young people, especially women and underrepresented people of color, to pursue a career in engineering. Questioning your purpose isn't uncommon. I have questioned mine many times, most significantly as a mother. And not just with my first child, but with each of my three children. As I shared earlier, my mother came home to take care of me when I was born. And I view my mother as absolutely the best there is. So I struggled. How would I ever measure up to that example if I had to work outside of the home? I also knew it was important for me to work outside of the home. So I decided if I was going to do it, I better go big or literally go home. <laughs> but I also knew if I enjoyed amazing success at Lockheed Martin and messed up those three amazing gifts of children that I had been given, that I would have failed. One of the most common questions that I get from young women who are up and coming in their careers or with their own businesses and have started or are considering starting a family is, can I really have it all? Can I have a family and a successful career? In fact, a couple of years ago, I was on a panel with two amazing women, and we got that exact question from the audience. My fellow panel members answered first and basically said, no, you have to choose. Now, I have to tell you, we, we and my panel members, we have been simpatico for all, most of the answers throughout that whole panel. But I had to say, ladies, respectfully, I totally disagree. My answer is absolutely yes. And, woo, and you need a good support system, a lot of energy, and an honest, authentic perspective. Before I had babies, I worked almost incessantly. When my husband and I were first dating, uh, I was working on a really difficult project that required a significant amount of overtime. And we were about two weeks into our relationship, and uh, he asked me out for an evening date on a weeknight. I told him I couldn't do it because I wouldn't be getting off from work until 2 o'clock that morning. And he kind of gave me a sideways look. <laughs> and I said, but if you'd like, you can come and pick me up at that time so I don't have to drive home by myself. And he did. <laughs> you got to work that, ladies. You got to work it. <laughs> uh, hey, look, 29 years later, it's still working for me, all right? <laughs> So from that time, fast forward a few years, and we were married. Our family was growing. It was incredibly important to me that I be a very present wife and mother, which also meant I couldn't work until 2 in the morning <laughs> routinely. My job, like so many of yours, requires much more than an eight-hour workday. And so I remember early on in my motherhood, I needed to find some balance, as we called it then. And my family and I and the team, my family and my work team and I implemented what I called late days and pickup days. On late days, I would stay as long as it was necessary uh, that, to finish my work. And those were Tuesdays and Thursdays. On pickup days, I had to leave at 5.30 so I could get to daycare and pick up my babies. Now, this was at a time in the aerospace and defense industry where you didn't see a lot of pregnant up-and-comers with staying power. And not because they weren't there. I contend that it was because the environment was not quite ready or could not see how a nursing mother who had to pump twice a day and leave work after only eight hours three times a week could possibly be someone on the fast track. I was grateful to have been a part of an organization that allowed me to test those waters, put forward the right parameters, and continue to deliver. I can remember with my third child, Cameron, I was in my first executive position, and there was a really old-school colleague who was viewed as kind of the hardcore one of the group. And our executive team was in a meeting in the throes of a very intense discussion where I had a pretty significant voice. It was 5.15, and the discussion was nowhere near ending. And what kind of day was it? It was a pickup day. I was getting antsy, and I don't think I let it show, though, but I was feeling a little nervous. And lo and behold, my old ski school colleague turns to me and says, Stephanie, it's Wednesday. Isn't it a pickup day? You should leave and call in, and we can finish by phone. This statement 
this unexpected voice. He is the last person anyone would have ever expected to say that. He helped the entire executive team think differently about how work can get done. That was 18 years ago. It was significant. At our site, it changed our culture. My old school colleague, he certainly made a difference that day. He infused purpose into the moment, even if he didn't know he was doing it. You see, every one of us is multidimensional. We come from different backgrounds and experiences, all of which have shaped us into the people we are today. We need to feel comfortable and empowered to be who we are wherever we are. Bring our full selves to work, to life every day. I recently saw a quote that really resonated with me. Author Gail Sukiyama said, don't ever think that just because you do things differently, you're wrong. This is such an important message. Throughout our lives and careers as students, as moms, as leaders, we may feel pressured to change who we are to fit into a role or a team. I'm here to tell you, don't do it. I've often said that if I have to trade Stephanie in for a role, that's not the right role for me. Authenticity is so important. Don't let it waver. When you try to emulate someone else, it requires energy that you should be using to focus on performing and contributing and making that difference. You are far more effective when you can be yourself. That said, remaining authentic doesn't mean that you can just show up any kind of way and that you don't need to be introspective. Tweaking how you present yourself at different times isn't the same as compromising who you are. Let me give you an example of this from my career. I was the lead on a very large mission critical project and the gravity of the project was monumental. There was no room for error. My team and I, we were up to the task. We worked hard to formulate a thorough plan and I had the responsibility of presenting it to my leadership team, two bosses up on a monthly basis. I studied hard to make sure there wasn't a question I wouldn't know the answer for. I was ready. I was cool, I was calm, I was collected, and I went in and I gave the presentation. I was confident, and I was sure I aced the presentation, and then my phone rang right after the meeting. And my friend and mentor asked, how'd you think that went, Stephanie? I said, oh, I think it went really well. She said, not so much. She went on to give me important feedback that said the perception in that room of leaders was that I was too polite. They said I was so calm, that they weren't convinced that I, under, I understood the magnitude of the problem. Wow. <laughs> I have to tell you, initially, I was really upset about that feedback. I, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't be glad that I was calm and confident in the team's plan and how they could then have that translate into me not getting it. I accepted the feedback. Accept the feedback. I accepted the feedback, but I knew I was not going to go into the next meeting with my hair on fire either. So the next month, when I was scheduled to review the program with the leadership team, I reflected on the previous experience and the feedback I received. I knew I needed to shift my approach. And so as I started the presentation with this leadership team, again, two bosses up, I said, I understand that this program is at a critical juncture and that if we fail, if we don't fix it, our company is going to lose a lot of money. And that's why our team is committed to executing this plan flawlessly. And then I went on to give an update on the plan and where we were. After the presentation, of course, what happens? My phone rings again. <laughs> and I pick up the phone and my friend and mentor says, you nailed it. I didn't change who I was. I didn't have to trade Stephanie in. I did have to change what I said and how I said it. One of the, uh, the key tenets that I continue to espouse as I commit to being my authentic self is the belief that trust is the best way to get organizations to achieve amazing things. I've worked with my leadership teams for a long time to create an environment of trust. Some believe that trust is a soft thing and a nice to have. I commit to my authentic belief that it is a business imperative. As a leader, I believe that the most important job you have 
is creating the right environment for your team and your organization to succeed. I believe that trust is the underlying component of that culture or environment. And when you are a part of a team where trust is high, you outperform other teams, period. It's really that simple. Many of you are familiar with Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. His son, by the same name, wrote a book called The Speed of Trust, and I highly recommend this book. His message is when you need to do something hard and to do something fast, nothing enables that more than trust. I have experienced time and time again the power of trust. And when I have received feedback, and it's been fairly often, that maybe I ought to pound on the table a few times or throw out a few curse words to get the team really going, that motivates people, they tell me. I held on to my belief that being authentic and starting with trust would win the day. This conviction has not let me down. I know that through this pandemic, especially for those who are working remotely, we've literally been living in each other's homes, hearing our dogs bark, watching our children come into Zoom meetings unexpectedly. People have seen who we really are, and we have seen them. And it's been okay, which in many ways may be helping everyone to embrace the differences that we bring and to understand that we can do it differently. My hope is that this will continue way post-pandemic and allow each of us to more securely be our authentic selves. As I wrap up my remarks, I ask you to remember two things, if nothing else. I touched on them throughout, but I want to cement them in your mind. One, authenticity makes a difference. Show up authentically every day. This is what drives great results from a business perspective, but also from a cultural perspective. Authenticity breeds diversity, inclusion, and belonging, because when you show up as yourself, you give people license and freedom for everybody else to do the same. And there is power in that. And two, when you show up with authenticity, it allows you to infuse purpose into each day. I believe that each of us have talents and special gifts that allow us to make a unique difference, to accomplish something or influence someone or an organization that no one else can. If we live authentically and intentionally work to infuse purpose and make that difference, there is no telling what we can accomplish. accomplish. I want to leave you with one final personal story. A couple of years ago, I got a message from a female engineering student at a historically black college and university. And she asked if I would talk to her for 15 minutes because she was thinking about changing her career goals from engineering. I agreed to speak with her, and when I did, she told me she was a senior, and uh, she went on to tell me that she was thinking about changing her career goals because when she first started in her, her engineering classes, there were many women in the class with her. And in her senior year, she was the only one. And she went on to say that the guys didn't include her in their study groups, and she was feeling isolated, and she said, what should I do? I told her about SWE, I told her how in most companies we have business resource groups for women, people of color, LGBTQ+, and many, many more. I also told her that while we may not have enough women in corporate America yet, yet, companies like Lockheed Martin and others are making change and closing the gap. Most of all, I said to her, it might be hard now, but it will be worth it. For all of us here today, I say to you, don't give up. Don't give in. It is worth it. Of course, it may be hard to see at times, especially now, given the current state of our world and the challenges so many of us continue to face, perhaps especially women and women engineers and women leaders. But let me be loud and clear. I want to really make sure you hear me on this. You are building a career for yourself, and that's inspiring. What's more important, I promise, I promise you, you're inspiring someone else too. They see you. There's a saying that says, if I can't see it, I can't be it. 
When you infuse purpose into your life every day, and you show up as your authentic self every day, you are showing others that they can too. And that is how you change the world. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Stephanie. What a wonderful and inspiring presentation. As I mentioned to the audience earlier, we'd now like you to participate in a question and answer segment. So let's head over okay. to the seats. Okay. Can't wait to hear what's on your mind. <laughs> Before we get started, I do want to say that as an expectant mother myself, I am so happy to have heard your inspirational story about being a working mother. Um, it's something I know a lot of the women... I have lots audience. of tips, so you can call me, Rachel. <laughs> I, will, I will do that. I, I know that everyone in this audience is, is really looking at you as an aspiration uh, for each of them. So shall we get into yes, it? Let's, let's get, let's okay. Go. So from one of our audience members, thank you for being an inspiration to me at Lockheed Martin, so one of your employees. As a woman engineer and a woman of color, what advice do you have for other women to find our place in the workplace and make an impact. Yeah, preparation and finding your voice. It's so important, you know, often I get um, in mentoring relationships, people who will say to me, I think I didn't get that opportunity because, because I'm a woman or because I'm a person of color. Um, and I always say, let's not think that. Whether it is or isn't true, I've looked at myself and I've said, I am a black woman and I'm so grateful I wouldn't change it for the world. And, and by the way, I can't change it, and nor would I if I could. And so when you make it about being a woman or by being a person of color or by being whatever you name, fill in the blank, you disempower yourself to make a difference. For me, I've seen people who come prepared and find their voice, and that's the important piece. Find your, vo your voice to the point in, the, in my remarks. Your voice isn't gonna be like everybody else. Find your voice, show up and be comfortably you, and be prepared. There's nothing that beats preparation. But here, let me just say this. Preparation alone, because some of you are probably thinking, I'm always prepared, I'm always doing my work, yet maybe someone isn't noticing me. Here's a piece of advice I give to my mentees who have said, I'm working as hard, I'm as well prepared, but it seems like somebody else is always getting the opportunity. And I say it's important for us to be able to share how we're contributing, not in a braggadocious way, nobody likes that, that's not helpful, but to share the value that we're bringing in the, consistent with the values of the organization and the values of the leader. It's really important, so understand what your leader's talking about, the, the priority in which they talk about things, what your organization's values are, and then you're able to translate what you do in that context. And it's just really powerful and helps people to understand through their lens, because we all have our lens, through their lens how you're contributing, and it can be really helpful to your career. That is fantastic advice. Our next question. What are your best tactics for accepting and receiving hard feedback? Ooh, you know, at working 34 years and asking for feedback, because a lot of organizations are not good at giving feedback. So a lot of organizations uh, will tell you, oh, you, you've done such a great job to read a book, and then you don't get the next promotion, and you wonder why. Um, so you have to first really be open to feedback. And what I have found in my career when I wasn't getting the kind of feedback that I needed, and I'm gonna to get to that question, but I wasn't able to, uh, wasn't getting the kind of feedback that I wanted um, and that I thought I needed, I turned the question around to make it more comfortable for my leader to give me feedback. And I said, so I know you told me to take a training course and read this book, and I'm gonna do those things. And if, I, if you see me ready for your job, or if you see me ready for 
that next level opportunity, what things should I work on? Immediately, then that leader says, okay, I'm not criticizing, mm -hmm. so I can actually share development opportunities, and it just opens the door. The other side of that coin is leaders who give feedback that you can't do anything with, that is not constructive, or that the intent of providing the feedback doesn't seem pure. So people who are giving feedback, my very strong advice to you, I, I give a lot of feedback. And when I give feedback, I check myself to make sure my intent is pure and that I'm giving feedback to that person because I care about them and because I want them to succeed and I want our team to succeed. So be careful about how you're giving feedback. People don't always give it like that. So when I've gotten, I've gotten feedback both ways. And I, when I've gotten really harsh feedback that I just didn't agree with, I have said, perception is reality. And so even if I don't agree with it and it hurts, because when you get really important feedback, really good feedback, it generally feels awful. It generally feels terrible. And so what I have done is I have people giving me feedback and if it hurts and I don't agree with it, or even if it hurts and I do agree with it and I was wishing nobody ever brought it up, but sometimes it happens too, uh, I take the time to listen. I don't ever stop them and say, no, but you don't understand, I didn't do that. Don't, don't do that. Listen and say, thank you for the feedback. Let me think about it and can I get back to you because I like to talk about it more. Even if you don't want to talk about it more, you probably need to. <laughs> really. And so then it's important to have someone to whom you can turn, a, a good mentor, a good friend, and somebody that you trust implicitly to talk through that feedback with you. And, you know, just recently in this current role, I got some feedback. I, I, I am a leader who asks for feedback from my team. So I have one-on-ones with my team and I'm sharing things, they're giving me updates, and I say to them, is there anything I can do better, differently, more of, less of, that can help you to be more successful or for things to be easier for you? And so I've, I get feedback in that. And so I got some feedback as a part of that encounter, which I'll tell you, made me feel so good, not that the feedback made me feel good, but it made me feel good because when I'm talking about trust, they wouldn't have given me that feedback to their leader if we hadn't had that environment of trust. And I got that feedback and I have a confidant on the team and I said, you know, I got this feedback and I'm struggling with it. And we talked through it and came through it and was able to share back with that person who had given it to me and it just bridged an amazing gap. So don't reject feedback when it's hard. Don't retreat and say, oh my gosh, because I got this feedback, I'm a failure, I can never do anything. You got feedback, it's a gift because if you never got it, that's when it's harmful because you don't know that you are doing something or not doing something. You, it's called a blind spot. So if you have somebody illuminate your blind spot for you, even and especially if it hurts, thank them for that. And then go on and make that change, not trading yourself in, fine tuning, making that change, and you come back stronger and you grow. If you don't get the feedback, you won't reach your potential. I love that message of taking action mm -hmm. with the feedback that you receive, regardless yeah. of if it's good or bad or yep. painful. Yep. So thank you for that. Our next question, do you have any advice for striking a balance between authenticity and setting boundaries at work? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you, so this is a development area for me, okay? <laughs> like my life is kind of an open book and so it's, 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 it's interesting. So you definitely have to have boundaries. So being authentic to me means, um, as I shared, being yourself, not feeling like you have to trade your principles and your values in, sharing enough to be vulnerable. I think it's important to be vulnerable. I think that's a part of authenticity. And I think particularly for leaders, it's really important that we make ourselves a little vulnerable because everybody at some point is feeling a little unsure, a little uncertain. And if we as leaders always have it completed together and we're just rocking and rolling, then our team might begin to feel inadequate. So I think it's really important to feel vulnerable. So you do have to share some things. But it is also important that um, you're not sharing everything, right? Because it's not required. So I would say play it by ear. I have found in my career where I have been the most vulnerable and maybe taken down boundaries more than not is when I'm in mentoring sessions. I think that can really be important in those mentoring sessions as you live authentically and you're sharing. Somebody has come to you 
to say I need help and I don't understand or what, whatever they're coming to you for. And if you can sh share a little bit more with them into really how you were able to recover from a failure or after you thought maybe that would end your career. We all fail. So if you can share that, now, that's not something you necessarily need to share every staff meeting with your whole team. But during those mentoring one-on-one -on -one sessions, that can be a really powerful place. So pick your places, but living authentically just means being true to your values, not having to put your life on display for everyone. I think that's a really important clarification and it goes to building that trust mm -hmm. relationship yep. as well. So thank you. How do you cope with the initial failure of an event or of a test score or something else and be able to get back up and keep going? So I'll share with you one of the things that I view as one of my biggest failures of, um, of my career. And that some of you may remember uh, the, the Armageddon, well, actually we're in Indianapolis, so you all might not remember this, <laughs> okay? We, but in, in the, on the East Coast, there was this thing called Snowmageddon, and it was a number of years ago, you know, 10, uh, 15 years ago. And I was a site general manager at a plant in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I reported to someone who was in New Jersey. And I knew we were expecting all of this uh, terrible snow and uh, I was gonna close the plant. I thought I was empowered to close the plant. I was a site general manager. And I was on a staff meeting with my uh, Morristown leader. And my leader said, you're not closing the plant. What are you talking about? No, it's, they're not expecting that much snow. No, you're not closing that plant. And I listened. And Snowmageddon happened, and I ended up closing the plant after, of course, we, I turned out to be right. But I didn't close it in time for, to prevent people from driving into work. I had never gotten hate mail in my, to that point, 20-year career. Never. Not one piece of hate mail. And I got emails from some of the members of my team, and they said, Stephanie, we thought you were different. We thought you really cared about us. And clearly, you don't care about us as much as you do the business. As I was mortified, I was, I had let people, I, I traded Stephanie in that day. And I have never done it again. So what I did was I learned from that. And I'll, I learned from it. I said I was sorry and that was inadequate, but I learned from it. So the next time, fast forward, to 2014, when in Baltimore and all around the country, uh, violence, uh, police brutality against black men was happening, and Freddie Gray in Baltimore died. And I had sites in Baltimore, and there was a, a protest that was scheduled. And the day before this protest that was scheduled, there had been people that were injured in the streets of Baltimore. And I was the general manager, and at that, that time I led a much larger business, and I, there was a protest scheduled. My customers, who at that time Social Security and CMS, had decided they were going to shut down early, and so our offices were right there, and I said I was going to shut down early. And I got a call from corporate when they heard I was doing this. And get, you know what they said, right? Oh, no, no, if you're going to do that, we've got to first, we've got to check with Bethesda, we've got to check with this, we've got to check with that. You're not closing. What did I remember? I remembered I'm not trading me in again. And we closed our facility and we dealt with this, the, the circumstances. And it was the right thing. Fortunately, there was no violence. But when you fail, everybody does it. Figure out how you learn from it and you commit to the greatest extent possible to never let it happen again. And if you fail and you end up hurting someone, take the time to say you're sorry. It makes a difference. That is incredibly powerful, and thank you for sharing that and trusting all of us with that. I think you know, I think when you have experiences like that, when you have the, when you, when you really have learned and you've had challenges, when you get to leader, I am blessed, and I feel privileged to have the position that I have. So I think it's my responsibility 
to share so that people can learn and don't have to, you can have your own failures, but you don't have to have mine. You can learn from mine and you can skip that part. And then whatever failures you have, you can say, I'm going to help teach somebody else so that they, and this thing just keeps going. It, it just snowballs and it becomes this amazing thing where we can all get to where it is we need to be and infuse purpose and make that difference that we're placed here to make. This will be our last question. What advice would you give young engineers just starting their t careers to get visibility and to create opportunities for promotions? Okay, so engineers, people who are in the engineering organization. Not early career. Early yes. career, okay, I just wanna make sure it wasn't students or that. So first I would say just double down and make sure that you are doing you're building a strong track record. You're doing everything you can to deliver capability. And that capability means the work that you are uniquely assigned. It also means helping your teammates to be successful, to be helpful. A lot of times, in a lot of organizations, we're measured by individual performance. And you must perform individually well. So for, young, for, for early career people, make sure you've got that technical excellence, that technical aptitude. But also build a strong track record. And what that track record means is that you are doing your work and you're being a good teammate. The other thing is make sure that people understand your interests. Ask lots of questions. Not to, don't misunderstand me by saying, uh, to think I'm saying that you should be in, this, in your first role and automatically be looking for your next role. That's not what I'm saying. But it's important that people understand what your aspirations are. I started my, my career at Lockheed Martin as a software test engineer. I wanted to do development, but there were no development jobs available when I started at the company. And so I started as a software test engineer, really tried to be the best test engineer I could possibly be. And I let my leader know that I wanted to do development. So when a development opportunity came about, she said, and my, by the way, my first supervisor was a woman in engineering. She said, woo, yeah, and she said, Mary Warrens, go Mary Warrens. Uh, and she said, uh, when that opportunity came up, she actually said, I want you, you know, to consider that, which was a wonderful thing. The other thing I'll say, many companies like the ones you hear today, Lockheed Martin and the ones you hear are sponsoring and are here uh, today and for this conference, have leadership development programs. So as an early career person, look for those leadership development programs. Ours is called the Engineering Leadership Development Program. It's a three-year program where you have rotations in different fields of engineering on different programs. If you haven't already gotten your master's degree, you get your master's degree a part of that. You, you have tons of leadership training. And these programs are designed to accelerate your career and your readiness. So look those up. That is wonderful. So thank you so much, Thank Stephanie. you for having me. And thank you for what SWE does. You make such a big difference, and we really do appreciate it. <laughs>